Um, here uh, now we've got Smart Farming by uh, Richard from Pipeline FX. Take it away. Check test. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to do a, a talk on best practices in render management. A lot of it's relative to how Cube manages rendering, but a lot of it is based on concepts and um, challenges that we've seen doing product validations around the world with different kinds of organizations and what they do with rendering. Um, I'd like to start off with a little bit of history. Well, there we go. And show you where we came from. And some of you may have seen this film. The dream is always the same. We found it. We're closing in on the life form. Let's move out, people. They came to unlock a mystery. I don't see how any living thing could survive out here. They came to uncover an ancient truth. This is it. Dr. Ross has opened the door for us. I say we go in. What they did... What the hell is that? was unleash a force unlike the universe has ever known. Evolution in reality will take you. All right, everybody, here they come. Fire in the hole! No! It is not a fairy tale, it is true. So believe it or not, that was 10 years ago. Um, the background of our company, Pipeline FX, is the team at Square needed to render people and hair and cloth and um, a level of detail that had not been attempted before. They, had a, they built this studio in Honolulu, which was about 1,500 machines on a 100 base T network. Machines back then, of course, were single socket, single core. I think by the end of it, we might have had our first dual socket uh, server. A limited amount of memory, so there were a lot of technologies that had to be developed for speed and scalability um, that we still benefit from today. So this is our mission statement. We, we started the company because there wasn't a commercial software company that um, sold render farm management software. It was all grid software and in-house solutions or one-man shops uh, writing something from home, or a studio selling their own solution. <clears throat> but there weren't any software companies actually selling and supporting a, a commercial render manager. Now, it took a long time to take an internal tool that could even do something like Final Fantasy and turn it into a out-of-the-box shrink wrap solution. So uh, we are nine years in, I guess, this year. Um, so today we're distributed, we're mostly on the west coast, or our employees in Honolulu, but we have resellers around the world. Blue Graphics is our reseller, gold reseller in the UK. And uh, we have a lot of customers here. <clears throat> we will be doing most likely a training class, I'll mention it again at the end, um, in June if anyone's interested. Today we have about 500 customers in a little over 20 countries. And we're in really five primary verticals, which are film and visual effects. 
everything from really small boutique shops to people like Base FX in China, um, up to the larger VFX studios, many of them local. Post-production, Smoke and Mirrors has been a longtime customer here. Um, Deluxe now, who owns Method and a lot of the Method studios. Envy Post is another one locally. And post-production workflows still use the same applications that VFX studios are using, so similar render management still makes sense. We have a lot of broadcast customers, most of the major broadcasters. We've done a lot of consulting for people like ESPN and Turner Broadcasting, Major League Baseball. A lot of the TV shows, the Dr. Phil show, I don't know if you get that here, and uh, the Colbert Report, Comedy Central, they all have little graphics departments. Some of our design accounts, Dyson in the UK, but RIM that makes Blackberry, General Motors, uh, Disney Imagineering, which is, is all After Effects for theme park graphics, and a lot of educational customers, a little over 200 universities, high schools, community colleges and trade schools around the world are teaching digital media and rendering on Cube. We still have some games customers, not as much offline rendering or processing um, as in the past. And with that, I'd like to introduce one of our education customers and the host of this um, event, um, Simon Osborne from Ravenborn <coughs> University. And let me change your slide okay. so, so they can look at that too. Hi, my name's uh, Simon. I work in the operations department here at Ravensbourne. Um, so that means that I deal with like, supporting the server infrastructure. And about uh, three or four years ago, um, I was tasked with um, bringing a render farm to Ravensbourne College, uh, primarily for the uh, animation course, because as part of their uh, final project they have to produce a film which can be three to five minutes in length and with a number of groups doing that it's uh, quite a demand on um, computing time and it was a situation originally where you'd sort of walk around try and find a computer and they were locked for, for rendering by uh, students so we needed a solution to sort of address this um, and so I started this task and um, I began a, a bit of research into seeing what solutions were out there, what could possibly do. Um, actually uh, built a couple of little test systems to see where to go with it. And um, eventually I settled upon Cube because I found it to be probably the best one out of the box in terms of the fact that um, I could just get it up and running, not have to worry about too much uh, scripting or anything like that. Um, the render farm we have here at Ravensbourne is dedicated in that we've got uh, dedicated servers. We have about 20, uh, which all have eight cores, and um, it's a dedicated infrastructure supporting that. So, um, yeah dedicated network storage and it sits on its own network segment so any sort of other traffic should be kept to a minimum um, and it should uh, maximize the uh, performance of it in our environment. Um, the render farm we run here supports uh, a number of different applications and um, primarily most of the work is done in uh, Maya and uh, mental ray for Maya as the renderer in that. We also support uh, 3D Studio Max and um, After Effects. Um, one challenge that I found when trying to implement the render farm after going through a number of tests and um, trying to um, think about how the students could work with it um, was workflow. Um, I found in some of the earlier tests I'd have um, lots of troubles with jobs when people were putting resources in inaccessible places like in a laptop, some USB stick, or um, 
just having inefficient renders sort of running all over the place across the network. So one of the things which we uh, did was to have a workflow whereby the students would um, have their final job, copy it to dedicated network storage, mm -hmm. and then the render farm could just mm -hmm. work on it there and deposit the finished frames on that same location. Um, we have found uh, quite a few benefits um, to using a render farm solution. I mean, one that I've already sort of loosely touched upon in tying up machines, because um, being a college, um, resources are always a, uh, they're always it's always hard to get exactly what you would want in terms of resources. Um, so you can't really have uh, machines just sitting tied up. Um, and that with pipeline effects uh, doing the work they're doing and constantly developing the um, program, it was good to uh, know that we'd always have somewhere to go back to and know that it was going forward. And also that um, we could expand the render farm um, quite easily um, because one thing which has become more apparent as we've um, continued is we've the using uh, computers here has changed quite uh, significantly because we've now shifted more towards um, students having their own laptops so uh, technology like a render farm really makes things like this possible. Uh, so the students can work on their own laptops, uh, do what they need to do at home. When they come in, copy their final job up and then have it render out. Um, the Probably the most difficult thing about using the render farm for us has been our environment. I mean, with limited resources, we don't have the uh, luxury of having any dedicated staff. And then the staff that are involved in managing the render farm, um, I've, you, you tend to find skill sets. I mean, I'm coming from a background of knowing of servers and infrastructure, whereas other colleagues I work with know Maya and that side of things. So it can be difficult to develop it as a resource going forward. And also, given the way work tends to be done throughout an academic year, um, there can be sporadic use of the render farm, so it can make it awkward again to develop from that front. Um, we're hoping to move things forward, though. We're always looking for ways we can try and innovate and improve the service. I mean, one is obviously a constant evolution of new applications, new versions, but we're also helping, hoping to um, uh, have like some student render anglers perhaps, uh, perhaps maybe more an expert user who can help us with the testing of it and help us with the development <coughs> so that we're giving the users ultimately what they want. Um, so, basically, in closing, I'd say that Cube render farms in general are invaluable resources, especially for specialist education establishments such as us. And uh, given the environment, it does present unique challenges. Um, but I think it is definitely the um, answer to increasing demands in 3D pipeline. So, that's uh, all we've got to say on the Ravensbourne render farm. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. I, I should have said at the beginning, but I would like this. Um, good job. I'd like this to be interactive. So we have Ravi here with his microphone. And if anybody would like to ask a question of Simon about the program at this moment or any time throughout my presentation, just break in, raise your hand, or yell out something, or jump on your seat. And we can talk about it. Um, because I've been in, I've been a reseller and sold SGI and Alias and Wavefront for 20 something years and seen a gazillion presentations and just sitting listening to about what something does endlessly can get pretty old. <clears throat> so I'd, I'd be interested to know what you have as questions about the topics that we're going over or 
at the end anything in general. So feel free, raise your hand, stop, ask questions. I'd like to make it interactive. Anybody have any questions for Simon on Ravenborn at the moment? When you're, um, you've, you've got a resource, a render farm, how yep. do you distribute that to each student? Do you give them a, a budget in terms of render time, or how does that work? Um, at the moment, it's basically a case of first come, first served. Um, so, obviously, at um, key times of the year, it does present problems um, with everyone trying to render out at once. So, this is probably another area that if um, the farm usage becomes more consistent that we need to look at and see how, how we can do this. There are other features, um, from what I understand, that are coming out in Cube which may help us in this sort of um, area as well. The other, to answer the question too, there's two. There's a current feature of a frame timeout. So some people are using that to limit, saying that no frame can run more than two hours or four hours in our facility, and if we see anything longer than that, based on the ETA, we're gonna kill it. <clears throat> There's one way to gate it, but we're also coming out next week with version 6.2, and one of the features is a per user sub job limit. So you could say, not just a per host, but per sub, a sub job means um, even a, a single core, or two cores, or four cores. A sub job could run across any of those things. And so how many, concurrent sub-jobs do we allow this user to use on our farm? So you could give each student four concurrent sub-jobs or eight or something, and um, at least that ensures that one person can't come in early, flood the farm with 12-hour renders per frame. They have the whole farm for the rest of the day. Nobody gets anything. Uh, we have some other things with clustering that I'll go over later that can be set up for priority um, to try to more equally share things. Anybody else? Okay. To the audience, how many people are actually using render farm management software other than Backburner? Show of hands. No, you're not, Dave. Not yet, anyway. Um, on this side of the room, to the left of me, one in the back. How many people are using Backburner? Okay. Out of the people with their hands up, leave them up if you're just using something like 3D Studio Max or Maya. Okay. No one's using After Effects or any compositing applications as well? Okay, All right, cool. That's my question over, thank you. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, thanks, Simon. Okay. So, <clears throat> we like to talk about smart farming and, and how intelligent is your render farm. <laughs> In the old days, mo most people did not have enough disk capacity, and maybe they still don't ever now, but they didn't have enough render nodes. We need more render nodes, we need more render licenses. But today, there's a lot of infrastructure out there. The desktops are very fast, multi-core, lots of memory. Um, people have dedicated render farms, some of them are pretty big. And we're all about trying to wring efficiency out of what you've already got. So once you're utilizing that 98, 99% all the time, then you can buy more render nodes or, or more um, rendering software. But the infrastructure, the networking, the storage behind it, the server itself, the high density memory, the render man license, all this stuff's very expensive. Uh, relative to the cost of a smart render manager, um, it doesn't make sense not to optimize your render pipeline first, then have the data tell you that I'm just short of licenses or I'm short of render nodes. So we call this smart farming. So some of the issues I want to go over in this list, we'll get right into them. The first is scalability. We have the advantage of coming out of Final Fantasy's production. So in order to try, you know, at that time they had only rendered ants, DreamWorks had done ants and um, toys. Um, and then here comes people and cloth and hair and so the, the quality jump was huge. That's one reason I wanted to show the trailer. That, that's a 10-year-old trailer, but still not a simple bunch of animation and, and uh, modeling and things to do. Um, Cyflex, if anyone's familiar with that, cloth modeling came out of the Final Fantasy production. They actually tried to write their own renderer called Kilauea, which was a global illumination ray tracer, which was ridiculously slow and used a tremendous amount of memory. So it didn't get done in time to be used for the film. So it was eventually done in RenderMan. 
But in order to transfer multi-gigabyte scene files on a 100-base-T network and get the movie done with the about 1,500 hosts and CPUs they had, um, they needed to design something that was very thin TCP IP traffic and could communicate with what was the first iteration of uh, network attached storage. And what they came up with was a client server architecture. Other render managers, many of them are what we call peer to peer architectures. And it means that without a central manager, each node needs to communicate with every other node every single thing that happens and keep it up to date. And it's very difficult to grow that because that's a mesh that exponentially grows. So even if your network's fast, it's a huge load on the systems. And uh, when you get into two, three, four, 500 network nodes or render nodes, which is very common these days, um, it's difficult to sustain a very quick dispatching, fast, responsive system. So in our system, the render nodes communicate with the storage. The supervisor takes commands from all the artist's desktops. What do I do? And it just sends little instructions to the workers. You need to render this frame. You need to go get this scene file, go get all these textures, and then render frame three. And then I don't talk to you anymore. And you render frame three, whenever that's finished, finally, it comes back and says, I'm done. What do I do now? Render frame seven. That's it. So a single supervisor can manage a very large farm. Uh, and I have some examples of that and some stats later. The uh, second issue has always been kind of an ease of use. Well, on the one hand, we wanted to produce what was in a feature-rich API and toolkit for big studios. The fact is, especially in educational markets, students just need to be able to sit down and render something. Um, so no one really wants complexity. We're not looking for complexity. So we're trying to make all of this easier. And um, the way we dealt with that was by trying to build in um, job types for all the applications, including in-application submission. So for example, within Maya, when you go to render, it brings up a Maya render dialog, has all the options, but you're able to roll those up if you don't use them. There's a lot of options and saves it that way. <clears throat> we have an expert and a not expert mode that'll turn things on and off. But really you just say how many uh, sub jobs I'm requesting and what's the frame range. Because it's an in-application uh, plugin, it already knows the scene file, where it's located, where the textures are, and you just say render. So it's kind of a couple things, render, and it's off. Uh, we have things like thumbnail display by layer. So as you're rendering out Maya layers, you can scrub up and down and see thumbnails as they're coming out. Um, even for things like Houdini, there's an application submission. We have a graphical dependency viewer and you can move the dependencies around. So in the first probably three or four years we sold Cube, it was to game companies and large studios that had a development team. In the next couple of years, as Python got more popular, we started developing a real feature-rich GUI that was still customizable. And in the last three years or so, it's all been delivering all of that functionality in as simple a format as possible. And I'll show you a peek of what we're going to show at SIGGRAPH later that makes things even easier. Any questions, comments? Feel free. Yes? Yes, sorry. So our software runs on Linux, OS X, and Windows. And it's truly cross-platform. So you can run the supervisor and the worker and the GUI all Windows, all Mac, all Linux, or any variety. We don't require you to have one Windows server and everything else can be Linux or something like that. So we write three versions of the supervisor. Well, John, way more than that. When I should introduce, we have, where is he? He's outside, waiting uh, for his keys. But we do have one of our developers here, if anybody would like to talk really nitty gritty, horrible, technical, detailed pipeline stuff. Um, John is here with us. But yes, so we cover all the uh, OS's. Most common is um, CentOS, we see a lot for the workers. And then we're seeing a lot of Windows 7. And of course, artist workstations, we still see a lot of OS X. Performance was something we wanted to continue from the Final Fantasy render pipeline and not introducing bottlenecks into a, a render pipeline. So one of the ways uh, they dealt with that, we call it dynamic frame allocation. So within these plugins, we currently do this for Maya, Max, XSI, and Nuke now. We 
do the write the plugin and it launches the application in prompt mode on the worker so it doesn't consume a license transfers the scene file and textures one time and then like a blackjack table we're just dealing out cards so we say you start on frame one next server start on frame two so you don't need to chunk we support chunking but you don't have to chunk if you're fast you have fast machines and slower machines they're all going to finish things at different times and as you know within a sequence something comes in and out of camera First frames could be super fast, middle frames really slow, end frames back super fast. It's very difficult to manually load balance that. So as long as it's broken down to a single frame and the fast nodes just finish those fa first and ask for another frame, then we don't transfer the scene file, don't transfer the textures, it just starts on the next frame. So this dynamic frame allocation um, has kind of been borne out as the fastest way to render 3D and it was really mostly in 3D, large scene files. We're saving a lot of I.O., saving a lot of time. But recently, we've um, just written dynamic allocation for Nuke. And it turns out that even on very fast renders, there's sometimes a startup time. And we had a customer here locally doing a ton of Nuke renders. And there was a 20-second startup, 5-second render. 20-second startup, 5-second render. So with dynamic allocation, it's a 20-second startup, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, just chewing through the frames. So we've uh, continued that since the Final Fantasy days, and, um, and it does just make renders get done faster. So a render farm needs to be reliable. Uh, we believe that render management is a business critical application. You have a ton of money invested in your render pipeline. Um, it touches sometimes every machine you own all your storage, all your networking, all your render nodes, all your desktops, all the applications your artists use. And really in, in computer graphics, and I have another presentation I give <clears throat> that talks about how rendering is the creative bottleneck in computer graphics. You, you need to be able to look at what you've done before you can review it with someone, think about it, rework it, then re-render it, then review it, rethink about it, rework it. It's this cycle. But the problem is, over time in a project, that rendering keeps getting longer and longer and longer. Things keep being added. There's matte paintings, composites, lighting is now finished, character development. But the time, uh, you know, you start losing time for rethinking and redesigning and reworking. And that's when everyone starts living at the studio and sleeping under the desk. And so how do we recover some of that? It's by trying to compress that render window. And if you've got limited resources, the only way to do that is to maximize what you've got. But in terms of reliability, it needs to always be working. So some of the ways uh, we address that, um, one way that's not in this presentation, but we have a MySQL database. And everything in the system is event driven. All the events are recorded to the database. So even if the supervisor went down, all the workers keep working. And then you bring another supervisor up or restart it or something, and then it starts dispatching more work. But at least you have the whole history of your render pipeline in the database. <clears throat> but one of the uh, features that was requested from us a couple years ago was a big problem, was failure of jobs due to lack of a license. So you may have a limited resource. I only have 100 RenderMan licenses or 100 Nuke licenses, and my Render Manager just submits jobs. And if it turns out there's no license available, it just fails those jobs. It goes to the back of the queue. Maybe on Monday when you come in, none of your stuff is rendered. So with a supervisor, you're able to count things. So once, once we issue that 100th job that consumes that license, then we hold every other job that, that uh, requires that as a resource pending, waiting for one of those other frames to finish and release that license. So once it's released, then you can submit the, the, the job. So that just ensures that it's a lot more likely that your renders will be done. This is a big problem sort of over the weekend. You submit a job on Friday, it comes up in the queue Saturday morning, but there's no license, so it fails. In some render managers, it goes back to the end of the queue, still coming up on Monday morning, don't have any frames. So another topic is optimization. And this has been big this year in our product validations. We go around and, and talk to customers and prospects in many different areas and show them what we're planning on doing over the next three years, ask them what all their challenges are, see what we're missing, ask them to prioritize what we're doing. If you could have it any way you want, what's most important. And the thing that came up this year in the first quarter that was most important was host space licensing. And this means if you've invested in a render license 
And you can render, for example, as many threads as you like on a host under that one license. They would like the render manager to keep dispatching jobs to that host until it's full, not just spread them out across the farm until you run out of licenses. So we're just releasing this next week with 6.2. So if a host is already running Nuke, for example, our supervisor will prefer to dispatch Nuke jobs to that host over other kinds of jobs. It's not a completely perfect holds all other jobs at bay until it gets full of Nuke jobs, because maybe it never will fill up. And there's other high priority things that need to be rendered. But at least there'll be a preference. And uh, trying to tune that and maximize um, limited resources you know, is a big issue. Anybody else face that? Run out of licenses? Suddenly the 10 you have are in use across 10 machines, but they're only running one instance. So it's a common problem. Um, we, re we manage down to the CPU core, and you can carve them up any way. But many software vendors um, license differently. So we have to um, make sure we cover every case. Automation came up last year. And with the economy downturn, the studios that were full of people started to let a lot of people go. And then when the economy got better, they didn't hire them back. So, or they hired different people. But they didn't hire wranglers or night, you know, third shift nighttime people to watch the farm. And there was a lot of requests for um, some kind of auto wrangling. So if I don't want to hire anybody to be here after 9 o'clock at night, what can your supervisor do to ensure renders are going to happen that doesn't require a human? And we came across two common scenarios. So the first is the cookie monster scenario. So you have a render blade that is either out of swap, or it has a bad memory module, or there's just something wrong with it. It can't see a network path. And every frame you send it, it fails. So we have some rules. So if it fails, a machine fails like three frames in a row, it'll take the machine off the farm and send you an email and restart those frames on other machines. Um, you may have had a scenario like this where a single server chews through your whole render queue and says, I'm done. You did them all. It's all unusable. There's nothing there. All the other machines are idle. And it took 10 minutes. Just chewed through them all. So this prevents that. Uh, the other scenario is where the job is defective, um, can't see the textures, something's broken about it. So no matter where you send a frame, all your different servers are failing frames, or their file size is zero or something. So if we find that three frames in a row of a job fail, we'll take the job off and hold it pending and send an email. So at least then in the morning, your wranglers come in, or TDs, or even artists, and you kind of have an email list of these are all the problems. These are all the servers that have an issue. These are the jobs that have an issue and everything else should have gone through. So that one job, instead of rendering on 20 machines all night to produce nothing, gets off your farm so your machines can, can do viable work. So render, render queue sabotage is the cookie monster scenario. And then wasting render, uh, render cycles. Anybody ever had either of these issues? So these are bad things. Um, we've had a lot of uh, interest in this, and as people start to use it, they start to ask for more things. Some people, it's interesting, there's two different attitudes. One is, do everything you absolutely can do before you ever contact me about this. So restart that server, try it again. Restart the server, try it again. Then try it again on some other server. But keep doing all this stuff before you ever tell me about it. But then the other attitude is that maybe this stuff is important and needs to get done on a deadline, the minute a machine is bad, the minute a job is bad, get it out of the render pipeline, tell somebody about it, fix it, then put it back. So we're going to continue developing this framework based on what customers uh, want it to do and make it a, continue it as a framework so you can choose, yes, restart the machine, or try it three times, then send me an email. Another part of automation is smart clustering, and it sort of goes with the question about how to manage resources. Our clustering is permeable, so it's priority clustering. You could say that lighting always has priority on these 10 machines, and 3D always has priority on these 10 machines. But if lighting isn't using their machines, our 3D jobs will bleed across. Then when lighting submits a job because they have priority, it'll start pushing those 3D jobs back. It'll restart them on another machine in their own cluster. So we have passive and aggressive preemption. 
Aggressive preemption just kills it, takes the job. Uh, passive preemption lets that frame finish, then takes the next frame from whoever has priority on it. So when these things can be nested you know, by show or users or, or whatever. Um, but schools also use it. They'll have like an After Effects lab, a Nuke lab, a 3D lab, and in general, they don't share. They render locally on their machines, locally on these machines. So we've been going around helping schools to start setting up clusters. The After Effects lab always has preference on their After Effects machines, but if they're not around, jobs bleed across from Nuke and run over there. And it really, if you look at the number of unused CPU hours times the number of computers within a university, it's amazing. There's millions of CPU hours where they're idle um, without intelligent render management. And again, if in computer graphics, rendering is the bottleneck, you can really dramatically change a student's experience in computer graphics by allowing higher quality work, much longer format work, by harnessing all the stuff you already own. Questions? The lowest spec? No, not really. I mean, uh, memory is usually the problem in 3D. Uh, for our supervisor, it doesn't take a lot. Um, it's just doing small commands, uh, I mean, unless it's a very large, busy farm. But we always recommend just don't throw away machines. If you can keep them on the network, uh, we are able to, our worker software actually tells the supervisor that I have this many CPUs, this much memory, I have these kinds of software installed, and then our supervisor matches jobs to those resources. So if those old machines have what it takes, uh, we have memory reservations, so when you submit a job, you can say this job needs four gigs of memory. And, and it won't go to a machine that does not have that much memory. Uh, usually the really old machines just don't have much memory. So you use them for shake jobs and nuke jobs and, and smaller things or quick time generation or something. But um, more machines is always better, usually. Even if it takes twice as long to render, at least something's working on something. But there's not really a minimum. We have a lot of people use Mac minis as little mini farms. And they'll set up Mac minis on their desk, and that's a little render farm. Yes? So the question is using um, the render farm over the internet. I have something on the cloud later. Um, but uh, there's a lot of issues in distributed pipelines. The number one issue normally is being able to move assets and move production tracking systems and move everything you would need to move to be able to render somewhere. Um, if you've solved that in a multi-studio situation, then, um, then trying to move it out of a dedicated network that's already secure where you already own all the software licenses to some kind of a hosted solution or the cloud presents all of those challenges, bandwidth, security, and licensing. So we have a customer, I don't know if anyone's ever, has anyone ever done an extra normal movie? It's a little movie with the little characters and you type in what they say and what motions they do and it spits back a little animation of it and you can put it on Facebook and stuff. Yeah, it's hosted through YouTube as well as their own website. They're from Montreal. So they're pure Amazon cloud, wrote their own pipeline and back end. They use Cube to manage it and it spins up everything dynamically. <laughs> Uh, but they have user-generated content, no security issues, very small data sets, <clears throat> and um, they use a free renderer. So they're kind of a, a unique case of not caring about all the three problems of the cloud. Beyond that, everyone else, if they do use remote rendering, it's always um, you know, co-located. It's a, a dedicated set of machines, a dedicated network. There is security. They own the software licenses they're using. You know, there's, there are, and other people have talked about the cloud here, um, there are some uses of the cloud, but in terms of our product validation and talking to our customer base and asking them what they want in the next three years, enabling one-click cloud kind of things isn't on the list. It's not their biggest challenge, in other words. Um, utilizing, really utilizing what they already own is most people's biggest challenge. 
because there are a few successful companies of any kind that have zero infrastructure. They all have some kind of an infrastructure. They at least have fast desktop machines to create their content. Um, broadcasters are like that commonly. They'll just render maybe a small render farm, but maybe it's just all the desktops. And uh, we're even able to render on four cores of eight. If you're doing Maya, which is single threaded, you can render at kind of a low nice level on the other CPUs and render all day. <coughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes. Sometimes, it just depends on the renderer and the application. So if, um, if you have a Windows-based application that also has a Mac renderer available and can read the scene files, yeah, then you can. If, a, if an application is only available to render on one OS, you're not gonna be able to render on a different OS. Can I just add to that answer as well? Yep. Is that if you have, say for example, Maya, which is the typical one, you know, your artists are all on Mac, but your farm is Windows. Obviously, the paths that are different from the Windows environment to the Mac environment, Cube will manage the path translation for you. The artist doesn't have to do any scripting to change the paths. It's all done within Cube already. So if you do really want a hybrid environment, it's easy to do it. Yeah, almost all our customers are at least two OSs, if not three. So in general, if, if um, you know, we don't trick any licensing requirements and like for plugins, I mean you still need all the plugins on every render node if it's required. Um, render management won't change that. But you can definitely uh, render cross platform where it's supported. In terms of integration, render managers need to be integrated into other systems. So right out of the chute we uh, opened up our APIs and really worked on having full featured APIs for Python, C++, and Perl. And it isn't so much that you need to do programming, but if you want to, and even pretty small post houses these days will have one person that knows Python, they just want to change a little bit, write a script, and do things. So we try to make that easy. We also have dynamic menus, so any of our menus you can change in the GUI, and it's just a text file, so as we release new versions of the GUI, you don't need to branch your code and rewrite our source code. It'll just reread your menu changes and present those. We also have a simple command framework. It's a directory that you can just drop in the command line uh, switches and it'll just generate a GUI. So in about 15 minutes you can have a, an artist friendly GUI for basically anything that can be distributed on a command line. So you can do those yourselves or we just usually do them for people. Things like red encoding and all kind of command line driven things, creates a big GUI, everything's exposed, and it's just friendlier for artists to use. Last year, a lot of people asked for automatic movie generation, so even though I'm rendering a frame sequence, I always just wanna see a QuickTime movie. And I'm gonna throw away the frames, maybe even. So we added a button to all of our submission interfaces that, okay, render all this stuff, and then yes, make me a movie. It brings up a secondary process where you put your encoder in, but once you have that set up, it'll always then encode and create a movie out of the frame sequence. So these things are easy to save as templates and um, just speed up your workflow. This is a screenshot of RVIO from Tweak Software. Um, if you haven't downloaded a trial of Tweak's RV, it's a terrific preview playback tool. The Foundry is actually selling it now. And, um, those guys came out of ILM, and we came through London last year with them on a world tour. Some of you might have attended. Other systems like production management and asset management, like shotgun software, tactic from Southpaw. Um, we're talking to the Nexus people at uh, Dukesoft. Um, it's easy to integrate and very productive to integrate asset management, production management with render management. A lot of people have their own asset management system um, one of the low-hanging fruits of asset management integration is if you have an object that's been finaled already or the shots have already been finaled that contain that object and then for some reason you need to change it, if you check that object back in, having to go back and figure out <clears throat> all the finaled frames that contain that object and re-rendering all of those manually is a nightmare. But if you've got these integrated, you could just say, I've checked this back in, all the scenes that are finaled that, that have this object, re-render all those, and it can be automated. 
Uh, a lot of our customers are doing things with Shotgun for, um, with Maya, for example, where you do a Maya render and then it populates the uh, render as a thumbnail in Shotgun, puts all the render data in, and we've added some Shotgun fields so you can put in some tags when you submit it. And then when you do your dailies, um, you know who to go back to or what sequence it's on. You can re-render it, ask for changes. So th there'll be continued development with uh, the guys at Shotgun. We share a lot of customers. Any comment on integration or questions? Okay, on the business intelligence front, um, this is something that render management hasn't provided in the past, but usable business intelligence can make all the difference. So it's simply knowing, do I need more render licenses? And how do I know that? Well, I need to look at the last production. I need to see where the bottlenecks were. were. Was I completely utilized? Or did I have a ton of jobs pending due to a lack of a license? Or were they all pending due to lack of just available machines? If I need to buy 10 more machines or, or just more license, I mean, how do you know these things? Most people don't know, and they take guesses. And then there's a big war sometimes between people with the budgets and people in IT and the users. and Everyone just feels like they need more this or that. But we try to provide data so that there's a historical record and you can say that had we had this, we would have gotten it done this much faster or something. And we do that by recording everything that happens in the system and providing integrated charting. So there's a lot of um, charts that are available here, but it, it's over a period of time or the current running frames. You can save these charts, use them to go up the chain for management and, um, and pitch your case. That's inside the GUI. Outside, we work with a business intelligence interface called Rombi. And I was in China at BaseFX, and uh, Chris Burnbull, the owner of that studio, as I was unpacking to do the demo, and they already used Shotgun, said, uh, I wish some render manager would ever integrate with Rombi. That's how I run my whole business. All my financial data is in Rombi. It's easy to understand. I have it in my iPhone. And I, we pulled this out and showed him the interface. Uh, we first saw this at Zoic Studios in LA, and they run all their metrics through this interface. So we have all this data in our cube database. What we do is push every five minutes the changes in the database up to Google Docs. And Google Docs is just a centralized, secure place to pull data from. And then the Romi interfaces of reporting draw the data from there. So you can't actually look at a frame, you can't control the render farm, you can't copy files. So it, there's no security issues. But you can see the dispatch efficiency of the supervisor. You can see the average frame time per user. You can see how many CPU minutes a user has used, things like that. Um, and it works on an iPad or an iPhone. <clears throat> so remember that at the end of this, there's an iPad 2 being given away, which comes from us. And uh, we find TDs and render wranglers are walking around with iPads. And having this kind of data at their fingertips when a producer walks up and says, well, my show didn't get any resources last night. Oh, no, your main compositor here used, you know, 5,000 CPU minutes. See? It's right here. Go away. So even if it's just defense, um, but to understand problems. And this chart was important to one of our customers. Uh, there was a movie about to be released, and it was almost done, and everyone had been up for days. I was in uh, Hawaii, so luckily the time zone was different, and I got the call that the whole render system is falling apart. And it's that dispatch efficiency dropping from 90 plus percent to 40 something or 50 percent, and they didn't know why. But looking at the uh, iPad, they were able to see that line drop, and we were able to see the time that it happened. So after I woke John up and asked him to call them, they figured out that they had actually started a cron job of moving a ton of data, three sets of data on an archive that had just normally been OK, but it wasn't crunch day when those things happened. And by moving all that data at the same time, it was starving all the workers for accessing data. So the workers thought that they were down. The supervisor thought the workers were down, and it wasn't dispatching any jobs. So by looking at that, they knew the exact time. What's happening at 12.45 AM? Oh, we have this cron job. Well, kill that cron job, and then that line just shot straight back up. So now they're back to 98% dispatch efficiency. Oh, now we're going to get done. Everyone's about to kill themselves five minutes ago. You know? And really, without this kind of reporting, I mean, I don't know how you know that. 
be running around a big studio full of machines and data centers trying to figure out why suddenly the dispatch efficiency fell apart. So the, the more quickly understandable data and ways of understanding it you can have, it makes a huge difference. And Romby is well known for just really easy interactive, these are uh, you know iPhone, iPad, so you can drag things around and interact with them with your hands. Any questions on reporting or charting? Yep. Not yet. Um, if you, I don't know if Androids can VPN, but I mean, if you can VPN, you can run our GUI. But uh, Romby is specific to iPhone and and, um, and iPad. If enough customers asked us to, you know, we probably would. iPads are really prevalent now in studios, and within education, they want to be. I'm not sure if they are yet, but and it's just a, a nice portable size. So another challenge is in flexibility and kind of a description of our licensing model. We decided that all of our licenses need to be just floating and cross-platform. So you can load the software everywhere. And if you own, let's say, 20 licenses and you have 100 machines, it'll render on 20 available machines. But it could be 20 different machines all the time. Uh, just a, a note on how we license. We call a two-socket machine a host. And in general, price performance wise, it, it's kind of always been for a long time two single core, two dual core, two quad core, two six core, two eight core is kind of the price performance. We have a few customers, Silver Draft Studios is one. They're a mobile previs platform. It's a big trailer with an animation studio and a render farm inside it. And they have 48 core servers with super high density memory. But they have solid state disk, they have an InfiniBand backbone. It's a science project of super high speed. Um, so that's a little bit unusual. But we call a two-socket machine a license. Uh, there's no license required to submit or manage jobs. You have unlimited use of the GUI and all the plugins. Um, we also have an online daily rental program. So with a credit card, customers, two in the morning, say I want 10 more licenses for three days. It's a dollar a day. And they put the credit card in. We email them a license. They append it to their supervisor license file, and it just starts sending out more work. So this has been pretty popular. New for universities primarily, who only get funded generally once a year and spend all their money, is a prepaid rental account. And from that, with our new website that we'll launch at SIGGRAPH, we'll have a, an account that you can just draw from. So if you have permission, you'll just go on and say, I want another 20 licenses for two weeks, and it'll just subtract from the existing account and give you the license. As, as schools render generally the middle of the fall, a little bit at the end of the fall, a little bit in the middle of the spring, and then a lot the last two months of the spring. Uh, they can scale up and down dynamically by having a prepaid account. And those will roll over academic years. Any questions on license rentals or on-demand capacity? Okay, on, uh, and how are we doing on time, Rome? Should I whip through this? Okay. We have an annual subscription. Our people know a lot about render pipelines. We do offer consulting. We're gonna have a training class in June in London. We'll let everybody know about it. We offer on-site consulting and we use TeamViewer to do remote consulting where we'll just install render management software for you remotely in four hours and then uh, you're up and running. We've already talked a little bit about the cloud. Those are the issues. I have time to play the trailer? Everybody's seen Tron. Tron was done with Cube. There's some numbers around it. They kind of did a lot, but um, if you haven't seen Thor, you need to go see it. And I'll show you the numbers for that. We were at the Odeon Sunday. And, oops. Let me pull it up. So Thor was rendered with Cube and the 2D, 3D conversion by Stereo D. So we found it. Jane, I think you want to see this. You alright? 
death threatened me. Thor was so puny. A <laughs> what? He was freaking me out. Where did he come from? Name? He said it was Thor. You know, for a crazy homeless person, he's pretty cut. How'd you get inside that cloud? Also, how could you eat an entire box of Pop-Tarts and still be this hungry? This drink, I like it. Another! This is going on Facebook, smile. Your ancestors called it magic, and you call it science. Well, I come from a place where they're one and the same. But who are you, really? You'll see soon enough. God, I hope you're not crazy. Do you swear to guard the lives of the innocent and preserve the peace? I swear. I will destroy their kind. You can't kill an entire race. And die with them. These people are innocent. I have no plans to die today. So I recommend uh, checking out that movie. The, interestingly, the conversion was done at the same time as the uh, production. So Stereo D and Burbank did the 2D, 3D conversion, and they also did a few visual effects. They did um, some of the rain and snow. Stereo D. So here's some numbers. I'll leave you with uh, a couple slides of, of specs. They have close to 700 machines. I uh, just talked to Troy. So Troy Brooks is my business partner. We started Pipeline FX together. He ran the production at Square, and now he runs Digital Domain Vancouver. So they have completed, now in 24 hours rendering for Thor, they did uh, almost 13,000 jobs in one day. They rendered almost half a million frames in 24 hours. But the interesting thing, uh, it's not so much number of hosts, it's number of job slots. So in a 600 machine, close to 700 with desktops included, farm, they were running 7,000, almost 200 job slots at one time. That was their peak usage. So that's a lot of job slots. Um, in one week, almost three quarters of a million frames. And at one time, again, the 7,200 job slots. So really fast, Robbie, sorry. Um, this is all NDA. But this is a new business intelligence module, which is a, a uh, kind of a wrangler view or a prediction of job completion application. So green stuff's going to get finished by this date and time. Red stuff's not going to get finished. Yellow stuff, we're not sure. And there's different ways, and it'll be a framework of determining this. It could be just the average frame time of the user is being used. It could be the last time that sequence was rendered. There could be ghost jobs submitted, because you know these big jobs will be put in later in the day. Something that could be published twice a day to a web page and everyone looks at it and if you've got a problem, go talk to somebody. But uh, we have a board of advisors and a couple of really sharp people and some of the biggest studios in the world have this kind of thing. But I, when, as I listened to the description of it, I thought what three person post house doesn't want to know if stuff's going to get done by tomorrow or not? Or what school doesn't want to know if a student's work's going to be done by Monday? Everybody wants to know that. So if we have the data and we have the statistical models, we can provide an application like that. So we're doing product validation on this right now and hope to show it at SIGGRAPH. We're also doing a really stripped down, simple, super fast artist view GUI. It's just a, um, a progress bar, how many machines it started on, a file folder to go to the output location, uh, percent complete, an ETA, right click, kill, block, that's it. Not the rest of what a render manager does. So 95% of our users won't need anything more than to run this. Version 6.2 we're shipping next week, a bunch of features, and I talked about the per-user um, sub-job limits. 
distributed Houdini simulations, dynamic allocation for Nuke. That's it. Any last questions before Ravi kicks me out? Yes. Yeah, we support tile rendering. The question is we can distribute a single frame across multiple machines. We do with V-Ray commonly. Um, we also have a framework for net render for RenderMan. So we will gather hosts together to do that and then return them. RenderMan pipelines are a little different, but we do support it. There is going to be a feature, it's in our roadmap, called uh, multi-level job priority. So preview frames, if you have a 100 frame sequence and I want to see frame 10, 20, and 70 right now, so those get submitted at the highest studio priority. The rest of it gets submitted to, let's say, 10 machines at a normal priority. But then if the farm clears out in the middle of the night, bleed those across all the idle machines. That's a three level submission in one is on our roadmap for this year and was asked for by a lot of people. Anything else? Nope. I'll turn it back over to Robbie. So thank you, Richard. Thanks.